Good evening and uh, welcome to the Salem uh, City Council meeting for November 9th, uh, 2020. Um, I'll call that meeting to order and uh, if the recorder would please call the roll. Councilor Kayser is absent and in her place is guest Councilor Virginia Stapleton. Councilor Anderson. Present, but excuse me, Mr. Mayor, isn't this the Urban Renewal Agency and not the City Council? No, it's Council? not, but thank okay. you for helping me. I'm trying my best. <laughs> yeah, we'll do City Council first. <laughs> Councilor Nanke is absent. Um, sitting in for him is guest Councilor Trevor Phillips. Councilor Leung. Here. Councilor Osik. Is absent. Councilor Hoy. Here. Councilor Nordyke. Here. Councilor Lewis. Here. And Mayor Bennett. Here. Okay, any additions or deletions, Councilor Hoy? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we we don't have the Pledge of Allegiance on our agenda because it was not anticipated that we Oh, I, you know what? Here, somebody so. penciled it in. I apologize. Would you like to lead us? Thank you. Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag. of the United, United States of America, States of America. America. and to the sure. republic for which it stands, one nation, nation. under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Thank you. And there are no additions or deletions to the agenda. However, I would like to suggest that we reorder our agenda and take item 5C first. All right. Uh, if there's no objection, I'll just uh, consider it unanimous consent and we'll go ahead with 5C. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move we accept the resignation of Councillor Kara Kayser and declare the ward seat, Ward 1 seat vacant and appoint Councillor nominee Virginia Stapleton as guest counselor of Ward 1. Second. Thank you, Good. Mr. Mayor. It uh, pains me to make that motion. It pains me to lose our colleague. Uh, but I am heartened to know that we have such a fantastic counselor coming in and who was willing to sit in as a guest counselor. It turns out that our city charter is quite quirky when it comes to this situation and actually doesn't allow us to appoint Virginia as the actual counselor uh, because there's more than a year until the next primary. And so our rules would require a special election. Obviously, there, that's not possible in the short time frame from when she would take her seat normally in January. So she'll serve as a guest counselor for now, and um, that'll be that. Great. I hope, counselor, that's kind of a, a beginning announcement that we're going to take a look at a charter amendment to fix that quirky situation. That Absolutely. Really is good. Uh, counselor Anderson. Thank you. I, I support the motion with great regret. Uh, because we're losing a dedicated counselor, and I really appreciated sitting next to her. We had several sidebar conversations, as did you and I, Mr. Mayor, when you were sitting next to me, and that's that's a very appropriate. And she um, she was an excellent city counselor and really was able to cut to the heart of many things. And I have no doubt that Councillor Stapleton will be an uh, a worthy replacement for her. So welcome guest counselor, and we'll see you for real in two months. Now you're here for real, Councillor Stapleton, if you want to talk, okay? Thank you so much, Mr. <laughs> okay, good. You comment on anything you'd like. Just don't let us catch a vote. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Trevor. Uh, first off, I, 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 if I could vote, I would support the, the motion. Um, second, I, I just would like to take a moment to express my gratitude for the public service uh, that Kara has demonstrated for her community. She's been a powerful advocate, she's practical, and she does the work. I got to see her leadership firsthand as a member of the Salem Downtown Homeless Solutions Task Force that I was a task member of, and she was just phenomenal to, to see her uh, in action. So um, it's, a, it's a loss, but... The good news is Virginia will also be a powerful advocate for Ward One. So, this is this is in in a, in a rough spot. This is great. It's great. I appreciate your comments. Both of these counselors uh, are my counselors. So I've had the pleasure of working with Kara for uh, uh, many many years. Uh, nine years as city counselor from Ward One, and now six uh, or thirteen years, I guess four. Uh, almost four years now as mayor, and she's just been really a, a tremendous member of the council. I agree with you, Councillor Stapleton. Will will continue that tradition as I see it anyway from Ward One. So, 
I, I'm really looking forward to working with her. I've worked with her before on other projects uh, and find her really uh, positive and a delightful person to work with. Councillor Nordyke. Just want to piggyback on those comments. Kara, our loss is Silverton's gain. Best wishes to you wherever you are tonight. Thank you for your service. Thank you for making tough decisions, which is something we all must do as part of this governing body. You will be missed. And I'm so glad to welcome Virginia. I am so looking forward to working with you. So both a farewell and excited as well to see two of our incoming peers on the call tonight, both uh, Councilor-elect Phillips and Councilor-elect Stapleton. Welcome to you both. Very good. Okay, well, she will be missed, but just until you get in the office, Virginia, and then we'll look forward to your help on all this. Um, this is, uh, we haven't voted yet to say goodbye, have we? Right. Okay. Uh, if the recorder would please call the roll. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke is absent. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik is absent. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, we've accepted uh, Kara's resignation. Uh, comments from city councilors. Councilor Lewis, did you? Nope, just waving. Okay. Uh, Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm really um, feeling sort of sad and pained about what I have to say, and that's what happened over the weekend. Uh, with the Proud Boys and BLM and the Salem Police Department. I really appreciate the police departments giving everybody a warning of what was coming on. And um, I disseminated that and I uh, um, fully support the fact that uh, outside of expressing one's First Amendment rights, violence and destruction and property destruction are wrong. But I would also tell you that I, and I'm sure other counselors have been receiving a number of emails uh, uh, discussing the potential in unequal treatment between the Proud Boys, white supremacist, Second Amendment people, and the BLM and those sort of supporters. And uh, it, it, it just, it's painful for me to say that because I saw what happened in, um, uh, Lower LaFell part of Bush's Pasture Park uh, a few weeks ago. And um, I understand the concerns about what, what needs to be done in terms of we need to de-escalate the situation and not confront uh, people, especially people who are armed. But at some point, all this does is encourage them to show up and get more aggressive. And, and I really think when the new, um, police chief comes in and when we have the police audit, this is something we've got to look at. How do we deal with uh, expressions of free speech which uh, go beyond the First Amendment and how do we equally apply that to all sides of the equation? I don't have the answer, nobody has the answer, but I really think this is something that a council, uh, as a council, we need to look at. Thank you. Uh, Councilor-elect Phillips. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bennett. Uh, once again, I would like to extend my appreciation to Councillor Nanke for his 20 years of service. And I would like to thank Councillor Nanke and our outstanding uh, City of Salem staff for making my transition into public service as seamless as possible. I would like to thank our community for taking COVID-19 pandemic seriously and for the work that our community has already done. Together, we have achieved real successes. Unfortunately, recently, there has been a significant turn for the worse. Oregon has had a record number of new cases for more than two weeks in a row. Prior to last week, Oregon's daily record for number of new cases per day was only 600. Now, our state has had four days in a row with 800 to 1,000 new cases per day. We've had over 5,000 cases in the last week alone. It's only November, but it feels like winter is here. I'm an emergency room doctor. Working in the busiest and the best emergency room in the state of Oregon, simply put, our role in the emergency room is to save lives, 
But right now, those of us on the front lines of healthcare need your help to save lives. Please avoid large group gatherings, social distance, wash hands, use hand sanitizer, and most importantly, wear a mask. Wear a mask, save a life. Wear a mask, save a life. This is reality. By wearing a mask, you could be saving your own life or the life of a loved one. By wearing a mask, you could be saving my life or the life of my coworkers in the emergency room. By wearing a mask, you could make it possible for children to safely return to school. By wearing a mask, you can help keep our economy moving forward. A mask is a face covering that covers your nose and your mouth at the same time. Currently, national compliance with this critical guideline is reported to be only 50%. That's a failing grade. Objectively, we're doing better here in Oregon than the national average, but we're clearly not doing well enough, especially here in Marion County. If we work together to achieve closer to 100% compliance with the recommended wearing of a face covering that covers your nose and your mouth, countless lives will be saved likely hundreds of lives here in Oregon. I know it's been a long eight months, but your continued vigilance is absolutely worth it and utterly essential. Please learn from those of us on the front lines of healthcare. I have seen my patients get critically ill and struggle to breathe because of this disease. This is the most serious respiratory virus to face our country in more than a century. Our only way through this pandemic is by working together. We have done it before as a community, and I know that we can do it again. Wearing masks saves lives. For additional recommendations and regional guidelines and updates, please go to the Oregon Health Authority website. Please keep taking this pandemic seriously. Avoid large group gatherings, social distance, wash hands, and most importantly, wear a mask, save a life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Councilor Nordyke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, folks, I've said it many times and I will say it again, but hate has no place in Salem. And what saddens me too is the fact that this is a message that no matter how much we say it, it doesn't mean anything if our laws are selectively enforced. We've had a summer of protests in Salem and we had another round of protests just this past weekend as my PR counselor Anderson already discussed. I was not at those protests. And like many of you, I saw the videos and the photos and when you are looking at from a distance, it is like watching a movie through a keyhole. And I'm limited by what I see, what people tell me, and what people show me. And unfortunately, what people have been telling me over and over again, a common refrain that keeps coming up over and over again from the members of the community who talk to me, tell me that there is a double standard in how protests are being handled depending on one's political persuasion or the color of their skin. Make no mistake that this undermines trust in our police. When people do not trust the police, they do not call the police. This lack of trust makes our city less safe. Now, to be clear, the people who have reached out to me are not asking for special treatment. They're not asking that one group of protesters be treated better than another group. They're asking that every group be held accountable, that everyone be treated the same. They are simply asking that our laws be equally enforced, no matter your political persuasion. The good news is that we have a new chapter in policing unfolding in our city. The performance audit that this city council approved earlier this year is currently underway. And I look forward to speaking with the auditors about these community concerns that people have raised with me time and time again. And we have a new police chief coming on board in December. And I will look forward to sharing with him the community concerns that I've seen. And I would love to see the new community space that is available in our new Salem Police Station 
to be used safely to open its doors to the community, consistent with CDC protocols, consistent with social distancing, and provide opportunities to learn from our community about how we can overcome this. So I look forward to our new police chief. I look forward to this performance audit, and I look forward to continuing to talk with you, the members of our community, as to how we can ensure that hate is not welcome in Salem. The second thing I want to comment on tonight is the mobile response unit. I have a motion about that, and I'll be speaking more about that later. But I wanted to flag one thing for us early on at the outset, that this is a motion that has brought forth a, an incredible response from our community, from homeless advocates, from people who work with homeless veterans, from the mental health community, and from the business community, among many other diverse sectors of our city that make our city great. I see broad-based support from business and advocates alike for this motion. And I look forward to discussing it further with my peers. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to take a minute here and um, thank everybody for your kind words and your encouragement along the way for the mentorship along the, the last year or so that um, this has been in my brain uh, to go after. Um, everyone from the mayor um, to all of you uh, counselors, I've gotten to know a lot of you. So just thank you so much for the warm welcome. And um, just Kara has been, um, just such a great friend uh, to me and so helpful in the last few months uh, mentoring me and, and getting me ready for this and um, it's been a real joy the last few days to get um, emails and calls from constituents and people already asking me to help with certain things or or just different concerns and it just makes me feel um, just really great and really humbled and um, excited to get to work. And although I can't be voting, I know that I can be handling those emails and um, you know starting conversations with people. So just really excited to be here with you all. And um, just thank you so much for the warm welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I, I wanted just one thing, Mr. Manager, before uh, we go on. I serve also as the chairman of the Capital Planning Commission uh, we deal a lot with state property and what's going on here in town. I wanted to share with you that uh, at our meeting last week, we approved uh, moving forward with a Vietnam uh, veterans memorial at the southeast corner of uh, the Capitol grounds at the sort of the corners of state and cottage. If any of you are interested in this, it's an absolutely beautiful installation. Uh, with multiple facets to it. Uh, it's uh, got statues, it's got uh, granite and marble. It's, it's really quite a beautiful thing. So uh, if any of you are interested, just contact me and I'll get you a look at it. it I was really quite impressed with what I saw and it was uh, unanimously approved by the Capital Planning Commission. Uh, I serve as chair, uh, the plan, uh, chair of the Planning Commission, Chain Griggs is on it as well as Jim Bauer a long time uh, community leader here. So uh, I, I think it'll be something uh, as it proceeds forward, uh, it's being done with private funds. Um, I think it'll be a, a really great addition. Uh, it'll, it'll really complement the World War, War II Memorial and create a kind of a really contemplative plaza as we consider uh, uh, our country's heroes. So I, I thought it was, uh, uh, really a kind of a special, special thing. So I wanted to share that with you. Mr. Powers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two, two items. Uh, uh, first, I know there have been questions, concerns that have come in regarding uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, on, on Friday, I did issue, the city did issue a release to the public about Saturday's demonstrations. We had received information that individuals not from the Salem community and who had, were previously involved in damage, violent acts in Portland were planning on committing similar acts in Salem on Saturday. We were concerned and believed that the planned demonstrations in Salem could be 
used by the individuals to cause damage to property and threaten community safety. We proactively communicated with the community requesting cooperation to help protect property and prevent violence. On Saturday, the police department was prepared to protect the downtown and neighborhoods, assist peaceful demonstrations and marches, and keep demonstrators separated when there was the probability of physical clashes. The work of the Salem Police Department and the cooperation of the Salem residents combined for successful outcomes. There were no reports of property damage. Peaceful demonstrations involving hundreds of people occurred throughout the day and early evening in Pringle Park and on city streets. The Salem Police Department worked with the Oregon State Police regarding demonstrations on state property, the state capital, the state capital mall state park. Questions regarding incidents on state property should be directed to the Oregon State Police. I thank the Salem community for their cooperation with the police department and what we had feared did not occur, thankfully. And that says a great deal about the Salem community and its police department. Thank you. The second item is on Monday, there will be a council work session to uh, discuss the strategic plan, the city strategic plan. That will be at six o'clock uh, via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you for sharing that information. Uh, I think it's important the public realize there actually was a credible threat beginning Friday through Saturday and that uh, uh, there certainly are uh, ways to do an armchair day after call on how, how things are handled, but uh, I've received actually very few emails. I'm, I'm really quite impressed with the work they did. Nothing was uh, uh, destroyed. We, we did see some people board up windows, but uh, again, we've not seen the kind of violence we've seen in other communities, and I think we can thank our police department and the police leadership for that. Uh, so thank you very much to you and Chief uh, Moore. Okay. Got a proclamation for tonight. Whereas each year on November 11th, we pause to remember the men and women who throughout history served bravely and selflessly in America's armed forces, preserving our strength, and security as a nation. And whereas on Veterans Day, we commemorate the honorable legacy and sacrifices of our veterans, both those lost and those who thankfully are with us today. And whereas America has been blessed with an abundance of such men and women throughout its history, who courageously battled in World Wars I, II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Middle East. And whereas on this Veterans Day, we salute their bravery and dedication to the defense of our democracy and the sovereignty of freedom-loving nations throughout the world, and whereas the nation and the free world are eternally grateful for the contributions of American veterans, men and women, and to the advancement of the cause of world peace. Now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby call upon all residents to observe November 11, 2020, as Veterans Day, and ask that the holiday be commemorated with appropriate ceremonies in honor of those who have served and are serving to preserve the principles of justice, freedom, and democracy dated this ninth day of October, 2020. Mr. Then I had- Mr. Uh, Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, I'm sorry, Chris, yeah. It's all right, I believe Councilor-elect Phillips has had a comment. Yeah, Councilor Leck, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Bennett and, and Councilor Hoy. Um, I, I really appreciate this proclamation. Um, my brother is a major in the Army Reserves and he served uh, two, tour, two tours of duty in Iraq. Um, and I, I've seen the personal sacrifice that he and his family have made. So I know how big of a deal this is for, for all service members. So I too am you know, just very grateful. Great, thank you. Okay. I have a 
some uh, presentations. These are the uh, volunteer recognition awards. We're going to have to do them this way. Uh, if any of you have any other thoughts, this will be the first round. There'll be, uh, I think, three rounds of these going on at our meetings. So uh, we're gonna proceed. Uh, this is the At Your Service uh, City Department Awards. The At Your Service Award was created to those who volunteer their time and or services to the City of Salem uh, Department's work with volunteers to enhance their services and are asked to nominate volunteers to be considered for an At Your Service Award. This year, we have three recipients who will be honoring this evening and then following up with a socially distant photo sessions soon. First, we honor Christy Bowman, a volunteer with Center 50 Plus. Christy has volunteered in the position of assistant to the volunteer coordinator at 50 plus since 2017. She is a very active problem solver and is always prepared to assist whoever needs help. She's a hands-on volunteer who can readily step in when the volunteer coordinator is unavailable. Christy has participated in and helped coordinate numerous awesome community team ACT events as well as in-house events at 50 plus. She is also an active volunteer for the center's friendly caller program. This is calls from P uh, the center to uh, seniors and, and really has been tremendous during this COVID uh, pandemic crisis. Outside of 50 plus, Christy has served the Salem community as a community emergency response team CERT member since 2005 and shares her knowledge with Center 50 plus staff and participants during the safety information events. Since 2016, Christy has volunteered with the Smart Reading Program, helping young people sharpen their reading skills in Salem Kaiser schools. Christy's interest in volunteering is, quote, helping others, social connections, and giving back all my blessings, close quote. Thank you so much, Christy, and I look forward to uh, somehow socially distantly handing you your award for your tremendous service to us. Award number two is presented to Jason Lee Archaeological Project volunteers. 30 volunteers from the Oregon Archaeological Society at Willamette, Uni uh, Willamette University, uh, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, professional archaeologists, as well as volunteers from the city's Historic Landmarks Commission, devoted 600 volunteer hours in April and May of this year to complete necessary archaeological work at the site of Salem's Jason Lee Mission House, one of Salem's most significant archaeological sites. This devoted team assisted the private property owners with the required archaeological compliance for the redevelopment project, working to ensure that the schedule stayed on track despite multiple challenges. Volunteers practice social distancing during excavation, wearing masks and gloves on site. Their efforts were exceptional given the circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic and often terrible weather. Their hard work resulted in the recovery of more than 2,500 artifacts, as well as discovery of the 1841 basement of the Jason Lee House. Many thanks to this group of dedicated volunteers. And finally, our At Your Service Award this year is presented to Friends of Pioneer Cemetery. The Friends of Pioneer Cemetery promotes the restoration and rehabilitation of the cemetery. This group led by current president Elizabeth Potter has volunteered countless hours over many, many years to ensure that Pioneer Cemetery maintains its, its historic heritage. Uh, Friends of Pioneer Cemetery leads three volunteer work parties every month to perform tasks such as plot grooming, moss removal, headstone straightening and repairs, pruning and vine pulling. Volunteers learn that spending time with Friends of Pioneer Cemetery members is a great way to learn community history, not to mention spending productive, pro 
productive time outdoors with pleasant company. Each year during the Memorial Day weekend, Friends of Pioneer Cemetery hosts an information station where visitors can obtain details and assistance locating burial sites. Friends of Pioneer Cemetery also promotes awareness of the cemetery as a resource for community history by staging periodic educational programs for the public. The group has participated in ceremonies to dedicate restored grave markers. They sponsor periodic tours of the final resting places of noted figures in Salem and Oregon history. Each headstone is important as a means of locating a final resting place and providing vital information about Salem's pioneer generation, civic and business leaders, and everyday residents. The database is maintained by the genealogical division of uh, the Cemetery Association. This information is especially helpful to families tracing their roots or for those interested in obtaining more information about the history of Salem. The city depends on Friends of Pioneer Cemetery volunteers to monitor leaning, fallen, or damaged gravestones. The work of the Friends enhances and highlights value of our beautiful community. Many, many thanks to Friends of Pioneer Cemetery and its members for playing such an important role in the preservation of Salem's unique history. So thank you all. We'll be doing more of these in the future. Uh, really appreciate the tremendous work that the volunteers in this community bring to support the city, its residents, uh, and city departments. So thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to public comment. This is an opportunity for people to speak who are speaking on uh, issues on the agenda. So I'm going to call on Tim Black and speak on 5A. Hi, thank you all councilors and Mayor Bennett for the opportunity to chat with you a little bit. <clears throat> I'm not currently a Salem resident, but I did grow up in Ward 6 and 8. Um, I'm speaking to you tonight from Eugene, and I wanted to give a little bit of context about the CAHOOTS program that we have down here in Eugene and Springfield, understanding that it's up you know, for consideration with you all. Um, really kind of looking at how, how the CAHOOTS program fits into the larger framework of our public safety response here in Eugene and Springfield, um, I wanted to drill in on, on the responses just in the city of Eugene. Last year, there were 105,000 calls for service that came through the public safety dispatch system. CAHOOTS responded to 18,000 of those calls for service. Of those 18,000 calls for service, uh, we responded to 15,000 of those without any sort of other public safety infrastructure, without you know police, fire, or EMS services. Um, and 13,000 of those calls would have required police to respond if CAHOOTS teams hadn't been available. Um, through those thousands, you know, the 18,000 responses that we had last year, we only needed to call the police in for escalated situations or um, to, to support getting somebody connected to higher level care 311 times. That's less than 1% of our calls for service that are resulting in that, you know, extended police contact. Um, we utilize uh, an integrated health approach, which puts an EMT and a crisis worker on our van to, to really be able to respond to all manner of calls for service that are really related to uh, you know, issues around mental health, addiction, poverty, housing. And I think it's really important to recognize that we resolve most of these calls for service out in the field without really needing to rely on you know, other brick and mortar institutions. Um, but when we are in a place where we do need to get somebody connected to those services, you know, the, the ability to transport without utilizing other systems like an ambulance or, you know, a squad car to get somebody somewhere else really allows us an opportunity to, uh, you know, connect folks to ongoing support. So the next time that trigger emerges, the next time that crisis starts to unfold, you know, maybe because they've had that contact with CAHOOTS or the Salem Mobile Crisis Program, uh, that, you know, there, there's, a, there's an opportunity for them to, you know, start to work with more of the tools that we can support them in building. Um, and, you know, I think... The, the last thing I'd like to hit is, you know, while we recognize that this is a service that's really oriented around responding to the needs of those out on the streets, this also presents an opportunity for prevention by going out into the communities, you know, where folks are housed and in crisis um, to really allow them to ma maintain that stability, maintain that connection, and, and really 
um, you know, respond to the crises in a different way than, than what they've been able to with, you know, support from public safety here in Salem so far. Great. Thank you very much for sharing your information. Any questions? Councillor Nordyke? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Black, thank you so much for being here. I do have a few questions for you. Sure. You said that uh, a, a large number of your car calls are resolved in the field without having to transport someone anywhere. Can you estimate what percentage of those calls are resolved in the field annually? Yeah, um, you know, kind of using ballpark figures, well over two thirds of our calls, um, upwards to almost th three quarters, are are able to be resolved on scene. So that's, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. And um, when, and you also talked about Cahoots's role in prevention. And the impression that I'm getting from your model is that you guys could respond to calls sometimes before someone is even at crisis level. Can you give us an example of what that looks like? Yeah, so you know, one of the situations that we really encourage folks to to reach out to us is, you know, when you start to feel that that escalation, you feel, you know, you're feeling that tr those triggers emerge, and so we're saying, hey, call us when you start to notice that your, you know, your your breathing is a little more shallow and you're kind of feeling tense and starting to get irritated, rather than waiting until you're outside screaming at your neighbors. Um, you know, we we do a lot with our community education so that we can come in. Um, Cahoots teams are able to respond to calls for service before they've hit a priority level that would require police, fire, or EMS to respond, which really furthers that that prevention potential, right? Because we can come in um, as soon as the escalation starts, rather than waiting until it's you know turned into this really kind of big public event, this big public crisis um, that that gives us the opportunity to have um, you know a lot better outcomes, and um, is is part of the reason that we're able to um, you know really de-escalate these situations in large part without any sort of other infrastructure. Okay. Okay. One more question, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, the impression I keep hearing uh, when I spoke with you about a week ago is that sometimes people aren't going to call the police simply to say, I see someone out here, I don't know what to do. They're not breaking any laws. It seems like they should have some place where they can go that would be safe and dry. Does Cahoots respond to those types of calls? And as a follow-up, um, where are you transporting people to? Is it a variety of locations or types of facilities? Yeah, we do absolutely respond to those calls for service where it's not really a clear uh, intervention that's needed, but there, there's something that's going on that, that deserves to have some sort of support from a neighbor in the community serving as a first responder. Um, when we do transport, we're really looking to make sure that we're getting folks connected to services that are appropriate for the situation, for the crisis that they're experiencing, that are open and that are going to be staffed. So, um, you know, we take folks to shelter, we get folks connected to basic needs like that shower, that place to do some laundry, help getting a hot meal. Um, and, and here, in, you know, in, in Eugene and Springfield, we have the ability even to lodge folks in sobering and detox, um, which is another area where you know with prevention especially for those experiencing addiction we can really reduce the likelihood of an unnecessary police encounter mm -hmm. and uh since you mentioned sobering i know that that is important but i mean what percentage of your calls actually result in you taking someone to a sobering center if only out of the one-third calls that transport someone anywhere mm -hmm. how often are you taking someone to a sobering center compared to a shelter or other suitable location yeah you know it's it's infrequent uh you know a couple of times a night um that we're re really relying on that sobering uh, and again that is because you know we're able to rely on a, a larger system uh so you know as as salem really considers uh, you know, a mobile crisis program, um, bringing other services into the fold, like, you know, more low barrier shelter, other basic need services um, inherently allow us to start to address some of these issues upstream um, so that, you know, we have an opportunity to intervene before that addiction, before that, you know, intoxication has gotten so acute and profound that sobering is the only, you know, resource that would be appropriate for that individual. Thank hey. you. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Black, for your testimony. Can you tell me how many hours a day your program runs? We operate 24-7, uh, and we actually have 60 service hours per day, which gives us two vans overnight and then three vans during the day. Thank you. And how long has this been in, in existence in Eugene? That's a, that's a good point I should have brought up. We've been in continuous operations since the 4th of July, 1989. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Jim? Lewis. Uh, thanks, Mr. Black, for, for coming in. Um, so three, three vans during the day, two at night. Mm -hmm. How are they staffed? 
we we staff every response team the same with an EMT basic and a crisis intervention worker. Our crisis workers don't need to be licensed clinical social workers, uh, peers, qualified mental health advocates. Uh, you know, it's it's more of that kind of undergrad level of of education combined with lived experience that really sets our crisis workers up for success. And are these folks on the team, are they volunteers or are they paid professionals? We're, we're all paid employees of Whiteberg Clinic, which is a federally qualified health center that contracts with the cities of Eugene and Springfield for the service. All right, thanks. Okay, yes, Councillor Phillips. Thank you. Um, I, I, I really appreciate your time, uh, Mr. Black. Uh, we've spoken before at the film series downtown. Mm -hmm. Um, just briefly, uh, I, I know in the past that people have asked you to kind of quantify the potential cost savings to your community. Are you able to speak to that? And before you do, let me just say, I really like what I'm hearing. I like the fact that over two thirds of the people uh, can meet their needs out in the field. And I like the fact that we're, you know, avoiding, we're achieving that de-escalation and avoiding the crisis. So, um, now I'll let you continue with my question. Sure. Um, so, you know, we estimate that for every dollar being spent on the CAHOOTS program here in the Eugene Springfield metro area, that we're seeing a, at minimum four to five dollars going back into the community. Um, the, the total cost of operations for our program hovers right around 2.2 million. And just to savings to the, uh, the emergency room and the savings to the community from ambulance diversions, we saw eight and a half million dollars. Uh, we know that there's inherently, you know, a larger pool that we're saving, you know, from reducing involvement with criminal legal systems, um, diverting folks from the jail. We just haven't been able to quantify that yet. And how are you funded? We are funded in the city of Eugene by the city council. Um, so we're okay. part of the city budget. In the city of Springfield, we receive a combination of city funds and then some grant funding that came from, uh, from the state through the Oregon Performance Plan. So you cover both Eugene Springfield? Correct. Okay, very good, thank you. When did fire, when did uh, Snowbirds or uh, health group start? Yeah, Whitebird Clinic, um, our Whitebird. parent organization, yeah, um, got its start in the, the winter of 1969, 1970. Yeah, um, yeah so, you know, our, our parent organization's been around for 50 years. Who's now being recognized internationally, you know, it's been in service for 31 years. Yeah, we had a similar clinic open in Salem at that time. It was cry of love at that time, but mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it, we did. We were unable to keep that kind of free clinic going over the years. I think it's a real. It really demonstrates what a tremendous idea that was then and now. So thank you. Absolutely appreciate that. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Oh, Dr. thank Anderson. you, Mr. Black. Thanks for your testimony. Um, I lived in Eugene from 1973 to 2006, so I'm very familiar with Whiteberg and Cahoots. And I'm anticipating a, um, a, a positive vote tonight, and I uh, hope that you will be able to lend your expertise to the city as we move forward. I uh, really appreciate the work you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Black, for, for coming home, for, uh, <laughs> at least by Zoom. I right. really appreciate yeah. <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you all. Corey Poole. Hello. Hey, uh, I'm going to screen share here for a little slide presentation. I know how much everyone likes slide presentations. All right. So um, uh, last time I spoke, I was talking a lot about the problems. I'd like to talk more about the solutions uh, to the sit Oh, I'm sorry. Corey Pool, uh, 3100 Turner Road. I own Paradise Island Park, uh, which is a uh, uh, 213 household uh, senior community. And I'm also chair of the Semka Neighborhood Association. Uh, Semka has authorized me to speak on this subject uh, on their behalf. Um, so uh, as we all know, the uh, homeless uh, camping situation in the parks is dire. Um, it's a terrible disaster, humanitarian and environmental and in every other way. Uh, as we speak, our park trees are burning literally right now. Park trees are being burned in campfires as we speak. So, but let's talk about solutions. Um, I, I'm excited to hear about the project on Portland Road. Um, this is a project in Portland. Um, oh, it will not. Okay, there we go. Uh, these are Conestoga huts, uh, tiny villages. I know you've all seen some of these things. Um, the best thing about these is they require just a surface lot. 
uh, to get set up. They're very cheap, very fast. And let's face it, we need to take care of this situation about four months ago. So we need things that can be stepped up immediately. This is a, um, a, a social distancing camp in Portland that's worked out very well. Um, this is an older one in Portland, which is no longer there, but it gives you the idea this is right to dream too. Um, so, you know, this this really can work. So one thing I've heard a lot in talking to members of the community and talking to city staff is that we've tried talking, we've tried to find properties and we just can't find properties. I understand the, pro the situation that, well, the easiest properties to find are properties that the city of Salem already owns. Um, this one, I believe the city of Salem owns, it's across from the public shops off of a 22nd um, big empty field. There's also this, uh, public shops has uh, already fenced areas with electricity. It'd be very easy to provide services. It would be very easy to move these landscaping materials out of one of these fenced in segments and close it to protect the rest of the shop's facility. You could easily house uh, 15, 20 people in something like this. Uh, this is the triangle next to the uh, airport at Turner Road in Mission. Note, I am not suggesting places outside of my neighborhood. I am suggesting mostly places inside my neighborhood. But the reality is we need to protect our parks from destruction. And uh, any of these properties would fit the bill a lot better than our parks. So this triangle could house hundreds of people if wished, although I don't think it's a good idea to concentrate that many people in one place. Uh, the, ideally, we want to put camps around Salem so that you don't have a concentration of the population. Um, this is a, an unused parking lot on the other side of the airport on 25th Street. It has been chained up for some time. It is unutilized. It is already mostly fenced. It would be very easy to transition this into um, a surface campsite. Um, this is near the uh, waste processing facility for street sweepers. Uh, this is more city property. There's a whole bunch of city property out here that would be better than a city park. Um, this is the Mill Creek Industrial Area. Hundreds and hundreds of acres of undeveloped land owned by the city that could be utilized for a small portion of which could be utilized for homeless campsites, a near bus service, near facilities. Again, much better than using a city park. And of course, uh, uh, the top deck of the Chemeketa Parkade, completely unutilized, currently closed off to public use. Uh, this is right in the middle of town, out of sight, but uh, very close to services. This is something that could be used for um, homeless uh, services uh, campsite. And of course, one of the least used uh, spaces in our city, the uh, area in front of the Civic ha City Hall. Uh, you will very, very rarely see humans treading across this piece of concrete, but I could see this a small portion of this being utilized to house some of our unhoused population in this time of crisis. Again, much better than utilizing a city park where trees are being cut down and it's almost impossible to provide services. So I just wanted to present a few options there. I look forward to working with all of you. I'm available. I want to talk to everybody who wants to talk about this subject, but we need to move fast. We can't put this in the slow burn, fix this eventually because the parks are currently being destroyed. Great. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Corey. I, couldn't, I couldn't see the sign when I was screen sharing. I apologize. That, that's, okay. <laughs> that's okay. Okay. Anybody? Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on then to the consent calendar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar with the following exceptions. Item 3.2A, pulled by Councillor Lewis, and 3.3E, pulled by Councillor Leung. Say that again, Councillor. 3.2A, pulled by Councillor Lewis, 3.3E, pulled by Councillor Leung. Second. Huh. Well, I see 3.2A. I'm having a hard time finding 3.2B. Did you say 3.3B? 3. 3. 3B. 3. Okay. 3. Thank you. I'm sorry. Your second? Nordyke. Nordyke. Okay. And just, you want to go through them? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That leaves us with item 3.1A, which are the uh, draft. 10 26 20 city council minutes item 3.3 a is an intergovernmental agreement with the city of portland for stormwater sample analysis item 3.3 b sale of two acres at the salem business campus to discount nursery supplies llc item 3.3 c sale of six acres at the salem business campus to hd fowler incorporated 
Item 3.3D, retail lease of property located at 311 Commercial Street Northeast. Item 3.3F, renewal of intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon Department of Consumer and Business Services Building Codes Division. And that concludes the consent calendar. Councilor, I'm showing myself a note on 3.3E. Did I just misunderstand what's going on there? 3.3E has been pulled and we'll be, we'll do that under number five, special Thank order. Business. I am just, my hearing has just gone all to heck on, on this no stuff. I keep I hearing the wrong. Thank you. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor will answer <laughs> aye to the recorder when she calls your name. I just wanted to say, since Councillor Kayser is no longer on the lineup for the roll call, uh, it's going to have an overlap with Councillor Anderson going first again. So just to let everybody know. That's okay. We'll follow his lead. <laughs> Councillor Anderson. Thank you. I'm honored for the temporary head of the line position here. <laughs> Aye. Councillor Nakey is absent. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Osik is absent. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Thank you. Hey, very good. And we'll just uh, move on to special orders of business. Councillor Nordyke. Thank you. One moment, please. I need to go to my motion. Will you be speaking for a couple minutes, Councillor? Yes, I'll Thanks. give a short overview, but I do first need to make the motion. So I move that City Council direct staff to present Council with a proposal to implement a mobile response unit for the City, including funding options. The proposal shall describe how a mobile response unit will fit in with other services and identify potential community partners to share costs. Second. Second by Anderson. Now, will you be a couple of minutes? Oh, um, I'll be brief. I, I would say two minutes or less-ish. Oh, okay, so, thank yes. you. Yes. So we've just heard from Tim Black folks who I asked to be here today for us all to start getting a first round of questions in. And for those of you who have been uh, following your email, I'm sure you've seen the overwhelming support that we are getting from the community from a wide variety of community partners, stakeholders, who care about how we work with people who are experiencing mental health issues, people who are struggling with homelessness, people who have minor medical issues that a basic EMT can handle and so on. I wanna draw your attention to a few pieces of input just to show how wide ranging the support is for this project. Um, first of all, included on, in your materials is a letter from the chairperson of the Salem Area Lodging Association. He runs the Grand Hotel in Salem. He is writing on behalf of the Lodging Association to demonstrate those businesses' support for this motion. As we heard from Mr. Black earlier tonight, there are plenty of times when calling, we're not at a crisis point where we would even need to call a police officer or the fire department but there is a need to help someone who may be lost, someone who's confused, someone who is struggling, someone who is on the brink of a mental health episode. And that is where CAHOOTS can help supplement the existing services that we already have. And that is just one of the things I wanted to point out to you. We also heard from the former business owners of Ranch Records who operated in downtown Salem for 38 years. They recently closed their shop but they also wrote in support of this motion because as experienced business owners, they too could see the interest in that. We also heard from the book bin and from a bartender who all operate in the downtown area. So there is indeed support from the business community. Another category that we received uh, support from is Don Phillips with the, he's the mental health services director at VetCare. They operate a homeless shelter with wraparound services for homeless veterans in our area. And Mr. Phillips pointed out the profound need 
for supplemental mental health services. And that having cahoots means that if you are working with someone in the field and you do decide to transport them somewhere, people like a cahoots type mobile response unit can have at their fingertips the information for all of the shelters in town, the day centers, places where people can safely go. And by the way, as a quick plug for vet care, they currently have 13 open beds. So if you know a homeless veteran in your area, please get in touch with vet care so that they can receive the services. I just toured their facility yesterday. They do mental health, they do recovery and much more. And I really see a mobile response unit as a complement to other services we have in the community. This is about supplementing the important work that our police and fire already do. This is about supplementing the higher acuity calls that those organizations are better suited for. But as Mr. Tim Black pointed out earlier today, the vast majority of their calls do not also require a police response. They save an emergency room trip. They can intervene before someone is in crisis, before someone's hurting themselves or at risk of hurting somebody else. So for all these reasons, I wanted to bring this motion. And I would say that it feels like it's been roughly a year in the making. This mobile response unit was one of the first things I brought up when I joined you as a new city councilor. And so all I'm asking for tonight is for us to direct staff to start drafting a proposal to identify what those funding sources would look like, to talk to our community partners so that we can find a way to complicate, to complement, not duplicate our services that we already have. I'm asking for your support, my colleagues. Thank you for listening. And thank you for reading all of the emails that you received in support of this motion. Thank, thank you, Councillor, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, I thank uh, my colleague from Ward 7 for bringing this motion. I fully support the motion. I want to make sure that people are really clear that uh, if we vote, if we pass this tonight, what we're doing is we're asking staff to come back with a report. It's not actually implementing this program. I think sometimes people get confused by this step of the process. So I want to make sure that's really clear that if we pass this, what we're doing is we're basically getting a formal proposal from staff and then we'll consider the merits at a future time. So that being said, uh, I do fully support this. I want to explore it. And I do, I do think that it, um, anytime we can look for uh, non-law enforcement resources to address social problems such as this, we're better off. I do still have questions that I'm looking forward to have, getting answers to uh, regarding how this fits in with our current system how we're going to pay for it, who's going to pay for it, how it'll fit in, you know, with the overall system and be seamless and integrated and not like, not like Councilor Nordyke said, not a duplication or overlap. But so I, I am supportive, uh, but I, I do still have questions before we get to some sort of implementation. So thank you. Councilor Anderson. Thank you. I support it as well. Of course, I second the motion and this is fully in keeping with what the council has already done earlier. Uh, um, I, I put forward a motion that said we need to discuss the way police department handles non-criminal matters, including cahoots. I specifically talked about cahoots. And so this motion is just refining that to one particular area that we need to talk about. So it's a good motion. We should support it and we should move forward. And it's consistent with what the council did several months ago when we you know, there was uh, uh, issues about the police department uh, um, and how uh, and what they're doing. And so the police department doesn't have to do these things. There are better ways to do it. And I look forward to a full discussion and hopefully that will lead to uh, some sort of alleviation of the of the use of the police department for non-criminal matters that are really social services matters. And Mr. Black gave a very good explanation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Councilor Leung, did you want to speak? No, okay. Uh, Councilor Lewis? Yes, I, I too will support the motion. Um, you know, and I'll use the word exciting. Uh, we have a, a role model in Eugene that has been doing it for a number of years and with, with what I consider to be a great deal of success. When you look at the number of calls they've gotten and how many they've had to uh, use police as a backup is really, really outstanding. Um, and it's nice to have that role model for us to uh, to look at as we're uh, going down the road for Salem. 
I do, I do have concerns as um, uh, Councillor Hoy mentioned about the, the funding and, and we'll hear about that when the staff comes back. Let's not forget that it was not that long ago where we sent a, uh, we're gonna send a ballot measure to, uh, to the public for public safety. So there was ob obviously a sense that we needed money for public safety. We, we, we pulled that back, um, but I don't know if, if the need went away. Um, and so I too will be looking forward to the, uh, the staff report and how we could maybe have this happen. Great, thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Councillor uh, Alec Phillips. Yeah, uh, thank you, Amir Bennett. Um, and I appreciate the motion. If I could vote, I would absolutely support it and vote for it. Um, and I don't want to distract from this outstanding motion that's, that's before the council, um, but if there's an opportunity to specifically see how it could work in the future with the number one policy agenda, um, which is a navigation center and things that are coming online like the duration center and then a, a more of a stretch goal, the sobering center, I would love to see that information as well. But regardless of that, I would support the motion as is. Well, good, well, thank you. Uh, Councillor Stapleton, Councillor Elect, whatever. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I too just wanted to say that this is very exciting and um, just, I think uh, Councillor Lewis said it just perfectly, right? Just exciting and um, lots to learn here and excited to see what they come back with and how we can uh, possibly move into the future, uh, you know, tackling these these issues in a different way and, and something that's gonna be a real asset to our community. So thank you, um, Councillor Nordic, for bringing this forward. And Councillor Leung. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just going to speak briefly since everyone pretty much had said all the wonderful and exciting things that um, hopefully will come out, especially with the CAHOOTS model that we want to bring forth um, to Salem. I think it's a wonderful idea and that's much needed within our community. And I'm looking forward to um, the next steps and what that will consist of. I mean, we already recognize that we have a growing homeless community as well as a growing mental health crisis within the area. So it'd be wonderful to be able to see what, what kind of programming we'd be able to bring that would be able to support those communities who are in crisis. Very good. Okay, everybody ready to vote? Okay, if you please call the roll, Amy. Councilor Nanke is absent. Councilor Leung? Aye. Councilor Osik is absent. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Nordyke. Um, five B, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move we approve, uh, or I'm sorry, I move we adopt resolution number 2020 49 to extend the declaration of emergency until October 26th. 2021, consolidate the emergency, de emergency declarations related to unsheltered residents under one resolution, expand the authorization of emergency shelters and warming centers, and continue the vehicle camping pilot program, authorizing the city manager to establish rules for the operation of the program. Second. Second by Nordyke. Councilor, you. you wanna go ahead and speak and you just conduct the meeting for a few minutes. I will do so. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. I'm going to defer to the city manager and the city attorney for explanation of this motion. Uh, thank you, Council President Hoy. As was pointed out by guest Councilor Phillips, the, the COVID pandemic is not abating. Uh, we continue to have uh, incredible stress as was pointed out by comments earlier in the meeting uh, on the city's unsheltered residents. Uh, the announcement recently of an outbreak at the UGM uh, shelter just reinforces the need for us to continue to look at our sheltering problems that are exacerbated by COVID. Uh, this extends the declaration uh, as was summarized in, in, in the motion. Uh, staff are, are prepared to speak to specific aspects of it if, if desired by, by council, if desired by counselors uh, in, in I do recommend, staff does recommend favorable consideration of, of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Manager. And I'd like to welcome our, our new guest counselor there in Ward 4. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Councilor Anderson. 
Thank you, Council President Hoy. I don't have any questions. I fully support this, but I think that on one level, this dovetails into what Mr. Poole uh, uh, presented to us today. Um, those are a lot of interesting places there, and I, I know that this is COVID is is one of the the you know the emphasis of this particular motion, but it relates to COVID and homelessness, and. Uh, I would hope that uh, the use of some of this funds could be used to look at uh, specific areas, not just what Mr. Poole pointed out, but other areas that we might be able to put some sort of um, uh, uh, shelter in for people who need shelter. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nordyke. Hi, thank you, Council President Hoy. So I too, of course, will be voting in support of it. This emergency declaration is a lifeline to our pers our neighbors who are suffering in homelessness during what hopes what will probably be a very, very cold and very, very long winter. Um, by the way, to what just to piggyback on what uh, Councillor Anderson was saying, um, I've talked with staff behind the scenes about at least a couple of those options that he mentioned in terms of bare property. It's you know, I, I completely understand the frustration. You see vacant land, it seems like a no brainer, but you would be amazed at how often times it's not that simple. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of vacant property near the airport, but there are federal aviation laws that prevent us from putting up even tiny little structures, even, you know, uh, even Conestoga huts would not be an acceptable use that close to our airport, for example. But I nonetheless applaud the spirit of the message that he's bringing. We need to think outside the box. And um, I know that Tim Block works with folks who do Conestoga huts in Eugene, and I will follow up with him after this meeting. Um, I do think we need to continue working as hard as we can on this issue. And I look forward to supporting the emergency declaration. And I really appreciate all of the support from the community as they try to find shelters too. There are some private landowners who have stepped forward and said, yes, you can use my space for this purpose. Now is the time. If you do have vacant land, if you do have a vacant warehouse, now is the time for us to step up and work with you to lease it for the duration, to get people indoors. If you don't like seeing people outdoors, I welcome you to join us and being a part of the solution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor uh, Lewis. Yeah, I too will support the motion, although I have to be honest, this is a, a, a double-edged sword for me. I, I understand completely the idea of, of extending this for a year so we don't have to go through this process every other month. But on the other hand, um, I, I represent a lot of folks that are, are quite, have had enough with the folks that are in Wallace Marine Park. And um, and so when they hear that this is going to be another year, they're immediately going to think nothing is going to change, nothing is going to happen for a year. And I'm, I'm hoping that that is not the case. But my question is, um, let's assume that we were able to be very successful with the homelessness issue. Can we rescind this uh, order at any time? Well, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe we can rescind it at any time. But I see the city attorney has just popped on. We'll let him answer the question. Dan Atchison, City Attorney. Yes, Councillor Lewis, that can be rescinded by council at any time. Um, I just want to note that the the allowance for parking or for camping in the two city parks is part of a different um, emergency declaration related to COVID. This this one is somewhat unrelated to that, at least uh, the subject matter is the same, but it's a different declaration. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Phillips. Thank you. Um, if I could vote, I would support the motion. Um, I would just like to, you know, potentially be the bearer of bad news. Um, I don't see anyone talking about in the academic or the public health sphere that this is going to go away sooner than a year from now. Um, I mean, we're looking probably at, you know, at least another year or two. While there was good news on the front of a vaccine today, it's going to take months to get that, you know, make sure it's safe and then get it actually distributed to people um, in real time. So we need to stay vigilant and, and this, this is going to take more time. Thank you for your uplifting remarks. Anybody else? Councilor Young. 
Thank you. Um, I kind of want to echo a little bit of what um, Councillor Lewis has said, and I understand already from um, from our city attorney as well, like um, where we're speaking about for tonight's um, particular issue. But again, like in addition to um, Ward 8, um, there's also the the area um, that's combination of my ward, Councillor Anderson and um, Councillor Nankies or guest Councillor uh, Phillips, um, where it's in, in the uh, in the retirement um, retirement homes. Or, or the um, manufactured homes, like the impact that it's having, like what Corey, Mr. Poole was talking about earlier, pretty much like the impact that it's, and the stress that it's having, especially on some of the residents over there. So yes, we do also need to take into consideration where, you know, people who are unsheltered and they need a place to stay. But at the same time, what impact it's having, especially in having people, that many people, and it was not supposed to be necessarily geared for that many people in the first place, um, the impact that it's having on those communities as well, and making sure going forward that if we are, you know, keep keeping that in mind, especially the impact that it's having on the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I see Gretchen Bennett has joined us. Did you have some remarks you wanted to make, or were you just here for questions? Just here for questions. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor, uh, guest Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank city staff um, for the, the section on this about restaurants and uh, the funding that we're setting aside or making available for restaurants to get them um, some help when it comes to outdoor seating as we move into the winter months and the heating that uh, might be required um, so that we can help support those businesses and make sure that we have um, great local restaurants here in town uh, when we come out of this. Um, so I just really appreciate the, the thought that, that, that went into that and, and the help that that's gonna be for them. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? If the recorder will call the roll, please. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik is absent. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. <laughs> Councillor Nakey is absent. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, we'll go then to uh, 3.2A, Councillor Lewis. Yes, I uh, move staff recommendation on agenda item 3.2A. Second. Go ahead, Councillor Lewis. I'm yeah, I, um, I'm in full support. I mean, you know, I, it's it's necessary to spend the money. I have um, three questions, I think, and on uh, how this would affect certain circumstances. One is the letter that we did get from the Salem Area Lodging Association talking about their concern about what is happening in and around the hotels. I wanted to know if this, uh, if any of these funds would be used to uh, to relieve that. Also, um, and we've heard uh, from Mr. Poole again tonight, um, and we saw last time the the pictures. And as uh, as a frequent walker in Wallace Marine Park, I, I do know what the what the situation looks like there. And I wanted to know how this money would be going towards um, alleviating the issues that have been brought up about the parks. Um, and I think that was it, just the two questions. Mr. Powers? Yes, and, and with Gretchen Bennett's help, I think we can answer the questions. Uh, in, in the staff report, we do, uh, we do specify at, at a somewhat high level with, with some specificity the, the use of the funds. I think in response to the first question, certainly the sheltering options listed number one under background of $733,000. The intention there is for us to aggressively uh, assist with additional shelter locations, whether those locations would, would relieve some of the uh, nuisances, some of the activity that, that the, the lodging association is, is reporting. I don't know what certainly having people in, in, in better shelter is the intention of, of, of that funding. There's also an additional amount that's recommended of 120,000. Uh, that's very intentional to allow us staff to move pretty quickly as, as opportunities present themselves for, for additional assistance to 
our unsheltered residents. So Gretchen, anything on, on the first question before I attempt to answer the second question? If, if I understood the first question correctly, it might include the um, recent passage of funding from the Oregon legislature that would go through the Oregon Community Foundation to be able to purchase hotel. And we're watching carefully for that opportunity to come forward in discussions with our um, nonprofit and county partners. Marion County, as you may know, is are one of the counties that are eligible to apply for that. So we'll certainly be looking forward to accessing that resource for Salem as well, or for the region as well. Um, oops, sorry. Then on the Go second ahead. question regarding funding for the, the two existing uh, park uh, camping areas, certainly first the intention is to provide additional locations, additional spaces to relieve the pressure on those two camping locations. I can't tell you this evening specifically what that will look like. That is an overall goal of, of this recommendation. More specifically for the two camping locations, there is funding for parks mitigation of $180,900. There's additional money for the cash for trash program. Uh, operationally, we're continuing to enforce the, the no vehicle camping at the two overnight camping at the two park locations. Uh, I, I don't want to though uh, mislead or set unrealistic expectations. It is a very challenging, a very challenging sh situation uh, 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 for, for us. Uh, Gretchen, anything else to add to that? Well, I think we're estimating about 1,500 persons in Salem or without shelter. And before the day started, I would have told you we have about 300 shelter beds, but given Dr. Phillips's re reminder about COVID and today's news from the Union Gospel Mission, you can see that our shelter beds are not necessarily as we're able to predict them. And then you have um, a limited number of spaces in cars at the Safe Park program, but we clearly have over a thousand individuals in the Salem area and at this time don't have location. So it's, it's definitely a challenge. Mr. Mr. Powers, will will this include additional sanitation services as well at these larger camps at the parks? Gretchen, can you answer that? I know we have uh, Mark Bechtel also on with us this evening, and he may have information to share. I would be happy to turn it over to Mark. Mark, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of council. This is Mark Bechtel. I'm the Public Works Operations Manager. And uh, yeah, the, this additional money uh, is designed to uh, help us provide uh, more hand washing stations, uh, more portable uh, chemical toilets. Uh, it's designed to, uh, bur it, we had to extend uh, an existing water line in Wallace Marine Park further north. Uh, so that it's up, uh, it's it's now up towards the uh, the north end of the softball complex, and uh, we're in the process. But that, that line has been installed, and uh, we're now in the process of installing uh, the the blue uh, water barrels. I think you you've seen at both parks uh, that let us use uh, their kind of temporary faucets, uh, and then a, a permanent. A uh, drinking fountain will be installed as well. So more portable toilets, more hand washing stations, more potable water. Uh, also, uh, we're having to purchase some equipment that'll allow us to get into some of those more inaccessible areas, uh, all-terrain kind of gator type of, of vehicles so that we can get garbage out of those parts of the park a little more efficiently. Uh, also, a, a stand behind skid steer loader that is landscapers use to get into tight terrain areas so we can haul out some of the garbage a little bit easier. So uh, all that is designed to help us try to, to keep up with the sanitation demands at both parks. As you describe that, Mr. Bechtel, are you describing also more personnel 
city personnel in the parks on a daily basis? I mean, is that something being described there by the kind of work you'll be working on then? Uh, actually, it, we, we're not hiring any additional parks workers. We, uh, a lot of these services are contract services. The, the garbage room, a lot of the garbage services are contract. A lot of the, uh, uh, the servicing of the portable toilets is all contract. So uh, our staff is already spending a considerable amount of time in those parks. Uh, but the contract services will augment uh, what they do. Okay. Uh, Ms. Powers, uh, following up on Mr. Uh, Poole's testimony, will any of those dollars be available or are you thinking of using them for uh, rental or use of other spaces? Uh, you know, uh, he, he showed us a number of city owned, but are you also looking at other spaces around town where there could be uh, other locations for these kinds of encampments or a Canastogan or whatever? Uh, uh, yes, uh, certainly a, a broad definition of a, a managed shelter or camping location, yes. Okay. Do, we, do you have any timeline on that or when you would be back to us with something, do you think? Do you know yet? Gretchen, is that a fair question? <laughs> yesterday, last week. Two years yeah, ago, it's it's an, I was afraid. <laughs> yeah, a ASAP. It's it's an urgent. It's a critical and urgent need, and so we're examining options indoor, preferred as well as outdoor locations, and and looking for suitable solutions as well as assessing the capacity of our nonprofit partners to be able to piece together some projects. Councillor Nordyke mentioned some uh, business uh, folks she knows or property owners. Have you all been in contact? To make sure we're following up on her information. Yes, I've appreciated Councillor Nordyke's accessibility to me and continue to look forward to any referrals or partnerships she can identify. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Nordyke, for your work on this. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, of course, I fully support this. I just want to clarify uh, on your report about the supplemental budget and from where those funds are coming. And it sounds like you're saying it's funds that were left over from last year that were budgeted but not spent. Is that something different than the reserve account that we have to keep, or are they are they kind of co-mingled? Uh, the money is fungible, but I do think there's a distinct difference. We okay. uh, the recommendation is not uh, drawing down our established reserves. We we had a better financial performance for the year, the fiscal year that ended. June 30th. That is that is continuing in this fiscal year with the CARES funding. Uh, this is a, a one-time funding request, at least okay. tonight. Yeah. <laughs> one-time funding this time. request yeah. for, for, for needs that I believe and, and the staff believe are directly tied to COVID. Okay. Certainly, we've had a a sheltering need for a long time, as, as Gretchen just pointed out. This, this though, is tied to the, the, the need that's really being uh, worsened by, by, by the COVID pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Manager. I appreciate that because, once again, you know, we don't, again, want the public to think we're just running out and spending money we don't have and taking it away from something else. And so we've got the funds. And, and they're available and they're not going to be taken away directly from any other city program. That, 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 is, that is correct, Council. This okay. would, in that sense, yes, to answer your question more directly, th this would be coming from our fund balance. And we'll have uh, Bob Barron, uh, the Chief Financial Officer, will have a report for Council uh, later this year prior to the uh, January Budget Committee meeting, which will go into greater detail not only on the year end, or the previous fiscal year, but our performance uh, so far this year, which is which is uh, certainly been impacted, good and bad, uh, by by COVID and and the resulting uh, federal CARES uh, funding. But okay. so we'll we'll have that information for you uh, uh, probably end of November, uh, December. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a follow up question for Mr. Bechtel. You, I appreciate that you talked about garbage, and I'm wondering if we've considered stepping up our garbage collection game in some of these locations around town. It's probably the number one thing I hear about uh, garbage accumulation. Is there is it possible that we could 
do more garbage collection. I'm thinking right now specifically under under the uh, Market Street overpass at I-5, other kind of notorious places where people have collected. Yeah, we're, uh, we're trying to do kind of a three-pronged approach to garbage. Um, one is just encouraging the, the, the residents of these camping areas themselves to bring their garbage out. I think the Cash for Trash program is really the best example there. Uh, the third prong, uh, or I'm sorry, the, sorry, the second prong is to just have more dumpsters available, more receptacles available. Uh, and we have, we have uh, doubled the frequency of dumpster uh, services uh, with Republic uh, garbage services, um, you know, already. Uh, the third prong is kind of what we call the, the sweeps that we, we go through for garbage. Uh, and we use contractors for that. Uh, ODOT uses ServPro. Uh, we've been using Service Master. Uh, and where we do that is because we, we can't move these folks. We can, we can only clean around them. Uh, and so, uh, for example, today, uh, the city and ODOT jointly uh, cleaned up garbage at the I-5 Market Street uh, interchange area. Uh, and tomorrow, we're doing another joint cleanup with ODOT uh, underneath the Marion and uh, Center Street bridges in the downtown area. Uh, the good thing about joint efforts with ODOT is a lot of our rights of way are adjacent to their rights of way. And if we work together and, and jointly clean up those areas, we're not getting into jurisdictional issues. Uh, and so that's kind of a new effort that we've begun, our, our joint efforts with ODOT. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, we'd like to do is get into the, the deeper areas of these camping areas and get some of the, the larger collections of garbage out. And that's what some of those equipment purchases are what, what I, I talked about uh, prior. Uh, and again, trying to use our, our contracted services as much as possible, supported by city staff. Thank you. Okay, by ready to vote. Hey, all those in favor of the motion, uh, please respond to the city recorder with an aye. <laughs> Councilor Osik is absent. Um, Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Anderson? Aye. Councilor Nanke is absent. Councilor Leung? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Okay, let me move forward here. 3.3 E, it's an all. Uh, Councilor Hoy? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to start by saying um, that I'd like to declare a potential conflict of interest in this case. Uh, potential conflict of interest occurs when the effect of the official action, decision, or recommendation could have a private financial impact. As it relates to this case, I am a Costco member and I have been so since 1992. The decision could have a private financial impact. And I okay, you, you want to start with, let's start with you, Anderson. All of us Costcoites can. I'm a member of Costco. I have the same potential conflict of interest that Councillor Hoy has. I'm a member of Costco, same conflict. Member of Costco, same conflict. <laughs> member of Costco, same conflict. Potential. Potential. Vanessa, no? No Costco for me. <laughs> okay. I miss the Costco dog. I haven't had one in years, so yeah. <laughs> the hot dog you get for like a buck 50, so good. It's been yeah. years. Okay. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the City Council adopt the order approving Class 3 Site Plan Review and Class 2 Driveway Approach Permit Case Number SPR-DAP 18-15 for the development of the Kubler Gateway Shopping Center, including Costco, a retail fueling station, and four new retail shell buildings. Second. Second by Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I make this uh, motion out of a duty for the process. This council advanced this as far as we could, but we were dealt with a bad hand. And the hand was made up of decisions from previous planning commissions and previous councils. The Land Use Board of Appeals has weighed in on this process as has the Oregon Court of Appeals to make us, uh, to, that bring us to our current uh, vote. We have no choice but to ratify our earlier vote. We will continue to make the best of the situation within the rules and guidelines for the betterment of the neighborhood in the city. 
Um, Councilor Anderson. Thank you. I, I join Councilor Hoy and his feelings about this. And I understand this as a lawyer, we've basically been told by the Court of Appeals what we can do and what we can't do. And we've, we've got to follow those decisions, regardless of how we may have voted on this earlier. And here we are. It was appealed, it was taken up. We, it, it came back down with an order that is clear, both from our city attorney and also from outside counsel, who was a land use expert, who uh, our city attorney hired to give us another uh, uh, um, view of it. And he agrees. So uh, I will reluctantly support uh, the motion. Okay. Anyone else? Councilor Leon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you everyone for the opportunity again to speak on this matter. Um, the reason why I wanted to also discuss this report is because I wanted to again once express my concern and dismay that this was passed by council in September. In the words of a previous, uh, pre in a previous council meeting, I don't remember which city council had mentioned it, um, but pretty much like who you have in office pretty much at that time when a decision is made impacts a decision that could have come later on down the road. So that's, to me, this still doesn't feel good. These are real concerns that we've had from residents who've been talking about the impact, about the relocation of Costco, especially that will have the impact on the communities. I mean, most of you are Costco members. I'm a Costco member. And when we shop at Costco, what are some of the main things that we notice? First, the amount of business that it brings. And second, the subsequent amount of traffic that happens around the I-5 and Mission Street. If an accident happens, delays last longer. And I drive and I exit off the Cooper exit on the I-5 at least several times a week. When there's a car accident there, and there can be quite a few, delays are inevitable. When Costco moves in, the traffic we see or saw on Mission Street is going to also happen on Kubler. And on Mission, we're going to end up having now two large empty stores the Kmart and the building that was next door to it that left in 2019, and then Costco whenever it moves to the new location. And these are the reasons, some of the reasons why I initially voted no at the public hearing. And this is why I'm also gonna be voting no again on today's order. And I would like to urge my counselors, my fellow counselors to stand up and vote no with me. Thank you. You know, thank you, counselor, for reminding all of us decisions we make today have lasting impact. I think that's really a valuable thing for all of us to keep in mind as we vote for the next couple of years. Okay, anyone else? Councilor Lech Phillip. Okay, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I too am a Costco member. Um, and I don't know if we have to declare as a uh, guest council. You don't have to do anything tonight. Fair enough. Um, and uh, I think I live the closest of anyone on council to this uh, proposed site. Um, I followed this uh, since it's become, you know, more aware in the last several years. Um, and I, at this point, if I could vote, I would share uh, the position of Councilor Leung. Um, I am concerned that it wasn't the, the clear cut decision legally. I mean, I'm a doctor, not a lawyer. I could be wrong. But it's my understanding that the, the city um, was found to be correct in, in stating that the trees were significant. I did not feel that the um, ruling on traffic was clear. It was referred back to the city. So I feel that there is an opportunity there to think more about that issue. And my number one reason for bringing that up tonight is safety. Um, I have genuine concerns about how that's going to impact um, South Salem. So I would just like to make it clear to the community, I can't vote tonight. I'm not yet a city councilor. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to speak. Certainly. Okay, are we ready to vote? Amy, if you'd call the roll, please. Yes, Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke is absent. Councilor Leung. Nay. Councilor Osik is absent. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes. And we'll move on to information reports. Any, anything? Okay. We have a first reading. Ordinance bill number. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna, yeah, I go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Sorry. 
Ordinance Bill number 1320, an ordinance relating to the Public Art Trust Fund amending SRC 15. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I had a couple comments on the information report, if, if that's okay. I tried to wave my hand. I apologize. I'm sorry. I missed it. Okay. I'm sorry, Amy. We'll go back and uh, Councilor-elect Phillips would like to talk. Yes, sir. Uh, the, there were a couple of uh, recent land use decisions at the planning commission that are near here in ward three and i'm mm -hmm. i just it snuck up on me i apologize uh, uh council president hoy do you recall which one it is you were interested in 6f thank you um so uh in summary uh in reviewing the public testimony that's gone before the planning commission I'm aware that that decision was non-unanimous and that there was public testimony submitted that brought up specific safety concerns related to Reed Road. Um, so I just wanna make sure that the, the city staff are aware. I think they've, they've heard from me previously on this issue, but it is, it is a true concern um, and not just as a resident who lives near here, but as an emergency room doctor, I have genuine safety concerns for Reed Road. So that's all I wanted to bring up. Yeah, well, Councilor elect, I really keep that one in mind. Reed Road is going to be a separate action. It's going to be a batch of other actions as well. I hope you'll lead us all through on how to fix the problems out there. So become expert on that one, please. I'll do that's one that comes up fairly regularly. Thank you very much for bringing it up. Okay, let's let's try it again, Amy. Okay, ordinance bill number 1320, an ordinance relating to the Public Art Trust Fund, amending SRC 15.030, amending the Salem Art Commission Public Art Collection Guidelines, Policies, and Procedures. Um, if there isn't any objection, I'd like to pass this along uh, unanimously. Anyone got anything? They, okay. Okay. Anybody? Okay, the motion passes. That gets us to public comment, our final public comment for the council. Uh, Tracy Armstrong. Uh, my name is Tracy, am I, can you hear me? We can hear you, Are, do you wanna be Thank seen? I, it doesn't matter to me. Oh, okay. hold on, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh -huh. My name is my name is Tracy Armstrong. I'm a resident of Ward 1. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my concerns regarding public safety in our capital city. This is my first city council meeting. Um, I've been very impressed. I would like to say thank you to Councilors Nordyke and Councilor Anderson. I appreciate so much that you have addressed what I'm what I'm what I'm here for. Um, I, uh, sat, we are all aware in Salem, Oregon, what happened Saturday, November 7th, as well as Labor Day and several other days since March. We've had hostile extremist groups come to our city and take over our streets. To date, I have yet to hear our mayor or our city manager denounce these white supremacists who have who have, have, I have yet to hear you denounce the violent and criminal acts perpetrated against our residents by these extremist groups. I would like to also acknowledge, uh, Saturday I went to an event. Um, the event was, was at Pringle Park. We had hoped to have it, community organizers. My purpose for going to that event was to learn how to bond, how to, how to build bridges with my neighbors that may differ from me politically. So it sounded like a really great event. We were, it, it's been on the books for a few weeks. We had to move because the Proud Boys and a bunch of other folks showed up and took over the Capitol. So we moved. We're peaceful. When I showed up at this event, there were all kinds of, there were speakers, there were booths that talked about helping our community, helping our unsheltered neighbors. And thank you for addressing that as well. Um, I was in shock at the response from our police. At about five o'clock, the park cleared out. And I, I, 
the park cleared out. I'm going back to my car. I mean, people are packing up tents and things and the park clears out. And all of a sudden I hear, bang, bang, bang. this is the Salem police department. This is an unlawful assembly. What was that about? I was in shock. I didn't understand it. I mean, like I'm just showing up wanting to get some information to be a good citizen of Salem, Oregon. And that happened. So I, I'm frustrated, very frustrated that off that counselors Nordyke and Anderson addressed this lopsided response from law enforcement. Thank you so much, but I'm very disappointed in you, Mayor Bennett, as well as our, our city manager. So I wanna know what are you gonna do? Where are you, when are you gonna take, make the statement, make the public statement that this isn't okay. We don't want hate on our streets. I'm sorry, your know. time's up, Tracy. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Cindy Linuser. Good evening, um, Mayor, Councilors. My name is Cindy Lanasar, and I work in Ward 2, and I've had the pleasure of living here for 24 years. Over these years, um, I've come in front of this council many times providing expert testimony and sharing community data. But today I'm here to say thank you. Thank you to the men and women of the Salem Police Department. Through my career, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of different law enforcement agencies, specifically 10 years where I was a community mobilizer and led a multi-jurisdictional effort to reduce the abuse of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. One of our main efforts were to reduce the sale of alcohol and tobaccos to minors. During the time when we started this effort, our sales rate was 51% positive. In five years, we reduced that to 1%. Using reward and reminder visits, using education and other means to talk with retailers. When youth would mystery shop a retailer and ask to buy a product, when the, when the clerk declined the sale, they were provided a reward. When the clerk made a mistake, the youth would back out of that sale and would slide a reminder asking the clerk to card and decline the sale. This educational environmental uh, strategy helped retailers and law enforcement have conversations about laws, review strategies on how to card and ID, and build relationships of understanding and support. I bring this up because Salem PD very much is involved with positive community engagement that reduces harm to all of us as citizens. One is the Mobile Crisis Response Team, where officers partner with qualified mental health professionals, bringing care, compassion, and support to the citizens in need. Next is the Crisis Outreach Response Team that follows people in recovery and assists with connections to community-based resources such as counseling, medical care, and veterans services. There are so many things that our officers do and continue to do during pandemic, social isolation, fires, business closing, and riots, but Salem police respond every day, day in and day out. A friend told me once that their job is not for the faintest of hearts, but for the bravest, and I agree. In closing, I'd like to thank the officers of Salem Police Department for going above and beyond and many times in unseen ways, their service to our community strengthens the fabric of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, very much. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Emma Jonas. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, my name is Emma Jonas. I live in Ward 1 of Salem and I work downtown. This weekend's show of force by police against peaceful demonstrators calling for justice and police reform, coupled with the vague fear-mongering message sent by Steve Powers and the city's refusal to work with state police to establish a police presence at a far-right extremist gathering of armed, drunk people who represent a credible threat to Salem citizens, tells me and my fellow Salem residents exactly where the city stands. Last Friday, November 6th, the city of Salem and Salem PD issued a warning about unusual activity planned in or near Salem's downtown, including a high likelihood of vandalism and property damage. It informed us that Steve Powers had assigned additional police and activated special teams starting the next day. I knew there was a peaceful BLM backed rally planned for 3 p.m. at the Capitol the next day. I also learned of a stop the steal rally planned at the same location three hours earlier. 
In the city's warning, no specific groups, times, or locations were mentioned. This seemed odd. I knew that organizers of the 3 p.m. event had worked with the city to ensure the demonstration was above board. I assumed the warning was referencing potential right-wing violence. The next day at noon, far-right demonstrators, including Proud Boys, roamed the Capitol uh, Mall, openly carrying weapons, including paintball guns and assault rifles, and drinking alcohol. Surely, I thought, this is where those special teams will be stationed in case any right-wing extremists wish to cause violence again. After all, a member of the press was beaten and pepper sprayed at the last Proud Boy rally event in Cap at the Capitol. Two weeks ago, Manuel North murdered Herman Graham III in East Salem, stood over his lifeless body, and called him the N-word. Far-right, racially motivated violence is a very real threat. And yet, this Stop the Steal rally and its openly armed, openly drinking members went unpoliced. They broadcast via live streams threats of violence to any Antifas who dared to show up for the peaceful rally they had been planning for weeks. But nowhere on these live streams, to which I tuned in on and off for several hours, did I see a single police officer. The streamer I was watching explicitly said no police were present, not even to give out citations for drinking in public. As I walked from my car to the relocated Week of Action rally at the Pringle Hall, I found out where the police were, standing by in the safe corporation parking lot, just a block from our peaceful rally, clad in riot gear, hanging off of SWAT vehicles. The moment we left the park to march, we were followed by police. They blocked us at church and trade, declaring our gathering unlawful and threatening the use of force and munitions up to and including tear gas. We moved to the sidewalks and marched anyway because it is our right to do so peacefully. We were followed at speed by these vehicles who, when we turned onto Court Street toward the Capitol, opted to needlessly endanger drivers by forcing themselves the wrong way down the street. We were not being assisted. I understood the jurisdictional issues between state and city property, but Salem's messaging and the SPD mistreatment of peaceful demonstrators on Friday was unacceptable. City of Salem, your bias is showing. Remove Steve Powers if you will not denounce right-wing extremists. Stop protecting Proud Boys and right-wing extremists. Stop threatening violence on peaceful demonstrators. Stop fear-mongering and dog-whistling about vandalism and property damage when the real threat is in the jumpy trigger fingers of the armed drunk. Thank you very much, Emma. Okay, and uh, Kathy Belcher. If I said that wrong, I apologize. Oh, oh there we go. Um, there you are. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor. My name is Kathy Belcher. I'm a business owner in Ward 1. And I'm also the current president of the Alzheimer's Network of Oregon, a local nonprofit that provides support to those in our community with Alzheimer's and other dementia. I would like to speak briefly in support of Salem Police Department and acknowledge its support for the people that the Alzheimer's Network seeks to serve. Most people are familiar with Amber Alerts intended to assist in finding missing children. However, many people are unfamiliar with Silver Alerts a critical program, the goal of which is to protect older or cognitively impaired adults from injury and potential death that they may easily occur if they are lost or missing by issuing and coordinating alerts and search efforts. Wandering is common among dementia sufferers. It is estimated that about 60% of those who go missing for more than 24 hours will either be severely hurt or die, and over 80% will die after being missing for 72 hours. I would like to recognize SPD for its participation in Oregon's Silver Alert System and the education of its officers about Alzheimer's in order to meet the needs of one of our most vulnerable populations. I would especially like to recognize at this time Lieutenant Dave Carter, now retired, who has been a champion in this area and a great friend to the Alzheimer's Network. I remember Lieutenant Akata sharing a story one time of an older gentleman who had gone missing around State Street. It was winter time, cold, starting to snow as officers searched the area. As it became dark, they became increasingly worried about the health and safety of this gentleman. Officers alerted the public and other law enforcement, and they received word that the gentleman had been seen near the bowling alley. He was found without a coat, cold, wet, disoriented. He told officers he was going bowling. He didn't recognize the officers as police officers. He was afraid and became aggressive. The situation could easily have escalated. The officers were able to use their training to calm him, approach him, and eventually return him home safely. Without these officers, their ability to alert and mobilize help, their training, this gentleman could certainly have remained missing and died from exposure. There are people with dementia who are never found. 
I feel grateful to live in this community, to serve those affected by Alzheimer's, and to know the support that exists within SPD. Their compassion and their efforts to bring together resources and understand and address the specific safety concerns of one of our most vulnerable populations and those that care for them is outstanding. In this particular area, they are truly an example of policing at its best. And it is my pleasure to recognize them this evening and offer them my strong support, especially in the current climate where there has been so much criticism of policing in general. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Kathy. Okay. Second here. Well, we have no second readings. Uh, so if there's no objection, I'll adjourn this city council meeting and call to order, if I can find it here. Give me just a second. The Urban Renewal Agency meeting for November 9th. Could you do a roll call, Amy, please? Yes, uh, guest counselor Stapleton. Here. Board member Anderson. Here. Board member Nike is absent. Guest counselor Phillips. Here. Board member Leung. Here. Board member Osik is absent. Board member Hoy. Here. Board member Nordike. Here. Board member Lewis. Here. Chair Bennett. Here. Additions or deletions, Councillor Hoy? No, none. Okay. I don't see any public comment. So we'll move on to the consent calendar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of items 3.A, 3.B, 3.C, all pulled by Councillor Lewis. Right. Second. How are the others? Second by Anderson. That makes my job easy. That leaves yeah. us <laughs> item 3.3D, which uh, authorizes the executive director to execute the attached uh, convention center management agreement and the fiscal year 2020-2021 amendment and addendum to the management agreement for the Salem Convention Center to provide transient occupancy tax revenues to fund marketing efforts. And that concludes the consent agenda. Any discussion? All uh, the uh, recorder would please call a roll. Board member Osik is absent. Board member Hoy? Aye. Board member Nordike? Aye. Board member Lewis? Aye. Board member Leung? Aye. Board member Anderson? Aye. Board Member Nakey is absent. Chair Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes. We'll go then to uh, 3.3a. Councillor Lewis. Yes, actually, I wanted to ask a procedural question. I, I would like to move uh, staff recommendation on 3.3a, b, and c, and if it's possible to do that at one time. Uh, regret regrettably, uh, Member. Uh, Lewis, when you pull it from the consent calendar, you need to take each item, item individually. Okay, then I'll be real quick. Um, and it's you can talk about comment. all three now, and we'll just move them along. Okay. Um, okay. You know, I, I, the reason I well, first of all, I'm going to uh, fully support all three of these motions. Um, the reason I pulled it was. Have you made a motion on this yet? Did I miss it? Yeah, I, I move. Uh, Move 3 staff recommendation on 3.3 A. Second. Councillor Hoy seconds. Okay. Um, we, we hear a lot about that the city is not doing anything to address the homelessness issue. And these are all three of these things are things that we've been working on. They're now finally coming to fruition. And I think not necessarily for the sake of the council, but for the sake of the public that may be listening. Um, I would ask uh, Director Rutherford if she could kind of go over these real quickly and talk about um, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and so forth. Ms. Rutherford, Good why evening. are we doing this? 
Kristen Rutherford, Urban Development Director. So the first item on the agenda that we're discussing, 3.3a, is for a lease of property that the Urban Renewal Agency is acquiring at 2640 Portland Road Northeast, and that lease is to the Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency for a, an interim use of this space um, as a shelter. So the agency's acquired this property for a longer term redevelopment plans, um, but we have approval through DEQ uh, to make this space available for shelter or residential use for up to 18 months. There is prior environmental contamination, underground contamination on this property that prohibits the use um, uh, the DEQ is prohibiting the use for longer than 18 months, so we can only use this as an interim measure. Um, but through a partnership um, and this lease arrangement with the Community Action Agency, the Arches Project will be able to operate a duration shelter and nightly shelter and to get us through two winter seasons in this location. Um, we are, because of COVID spacing, going to be limited on the number of individuals that can be sheltered inside the facility. We're looking at about 20, 25 individuals inside to keep spacing. Um, and then once that is started and, and depending on operational capacity with arches, we're looking at expanding to a fenced um, enclosure in the parking lot where there would be organized tent camping and then for maybe another 20 or so individuals, and then car camping as well on the site. So we'd be looking at a maximum of about 65 um, individuals that could be sheltered nightly on this property and um, through two different winter seasons. Now, who's your target populations here? The tar yeah, so the target population in this one, um, the preference will be for seniors 65 years and older or those that are medically fragile individuals that are at a higher risk of illness if they are um, not protected from the elements. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Your next one's at 615 uh, Commercial Street. Yes, I, I see a question though. From, oh, I'm sorry, who's got their hand? I'm, I'm just not seeing it. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Lex Stable. Thank you so much. Um, so I just had some concerns and I know um, Director Rutherford, we talked about this um, earlier this week or last week, time has ceased to exist in COVID. Um, but I'm just, I guess I'm still concerned about the DEQ um, contaminants in that area. And, you know, every, anytime you hear that and then you say, we're gonna put some really vulnerable people in this place, um, I get a little nervous about that and want to, you know, ask as many questions as I can. So what can you do to, you know, instill confidence in this decision? Um, and, and are we communicating this? Are they, do they know about the contaminants? Um, are, do we know about the potential issues that could come from it? And, and are we watching for that? How, how are we protecting people from, and I, and I understand it's underground, and therefore um, somewhat safe. Um, but again, could you just ease my mind a little bit here? Yeah, so we have been very open about the DEQ uh, limitation on the site that has been shared with those at the Community Action Agency. Um, and we really have gone by the DEQ guidance and recommendation when it comes to this property. Um, it's not prohibited from use um, or like an office use, but they don't want to see it redeveloped into any sort of permanent housing because of the underground contamination. Um, we also have recent confirmation and recent testing that there is nothing that is airborne in the area. Um, so they could have more to do with a longer term residential use on that site. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that extra help there. Hey, you want to go on to B and yes, sure. So um, item B is relating to a purchase of property and a ground lease at 615 Commercial Street Northeast. And this is the Arches project property. Um, this is where Arches operates their day room center. And uh, it's the property where we have invested funds in the past for build out of a future sobering center. So this is uh, within the Riverfront Downtown Urban Renewal Area. 
Um, so we have urban urban renewal grant in this property. We also have um, our some of our HUD entitlement um, funds in this property or CDG, CDBG grant in this property. Um, those funds were used to build out the day room space, which added expanded restrooms, um, expanded day room space, showers, and laundry facilities in a kitchen in that property. So with urban renewal funds, one of the restrictions that we have is that while we can um, use those funds for capital improvements, we cannot use them to support operations um, or routine maintenance. So because we cannot um, support or subsidize, subsidize those operations with urban renewal directly, uh, one tool that we have is that we can use urban renewal for property acquisition. And by doing that, um, acquiring this property, we can enter into a long-term lease with Arches and by eliminating their debt service for that property and their monthly mortgage payment on that property, that frees up financial capacity within their organization to expand their operational hours. So we are basically trading their, their monthly mortgage payment of, of around $10,000 a month for the equivalent in expanded hours, daily hours and Saturday hours on that property throughout the life of that lease. And so we are, we are purchasing um, the ground itself, not the building um, because of HUD obligations that we have for relating to the community development block grant funds that are in the property. The, the building needs to stay under Arches ownership. Um, so we then are acquiring the land, we will enter into the long-term ground lease, and then they will use the savings to extend their operational hours. Any questions about that? No. Oh. Okay, 3C? Three, 3C. Three C. Three, three C. Nordyke has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, no worries. Uh, Director Rutherford, I want to say how excited I am about both of these proposals. I know that these things don't happen overnight, and I want to commend you, your team, and everyone at Arches for all your hard work in making this a reality. Um, in looking at the item on our agenda, this property at Commercial Street, it says that the sellers encumbered to maintain homeless services at this site for a total of 20 years, and approximately 17 years of compliance remain. So I, I guess I'm just kind of curious, you know, I mean, do we, what are our assurances about their long-term ability to provide the funding to help this continue to be a success in the years to come? Yes. So the, um, the 20 year timeline is tied to HUD compliance and performance on the federal funds that have gone into this project. So there's a 20 year compliance period. They're three years into that compliance period. So 17 years remaining. Beyond that 17 year window for the remainder of the life of the lease, um, we have mechanisms built within that lease where if something were to happen in their world with their funding and they were no longer able to provide services, um, or something else changed. They grew and expanded and wanted to relocate something along those lines after they reached the end of that 20 year compliance period. Um, we have a mechanism to um, increase the rental amount if they do not continue to provide services over a period of time, um, or if they wanted to assign the lease to another entity then we have an opportunity to renegotiate the ground lease amount for a market rate. Um, so while we don't have a mechanism to um, guarantee that they have funding to provide services, we do have a mechanism to adjust and modify the ground lease based on their performance. And want you see as well? 3.3C um, is not related to the provision of homeless services. This is a, a lease tied to um, the Saffron property that we've acquired and the adjacent to Saffron is the Runaway Arts building. So this part of um, acquisitions that we have been 
um, pursuing over the last couple of years. And the runaway arts building at that site, that tenant has relocated here in the last month. And so we now have a vacancy in that location. And um, the library has a need for some additional space for some of their activities. So this is going to uh, be a lease of space for some library services there. If I may, oh. Mayor. Yes. I think some additional context, uh, I think in, in response to Member Lewis's question, I think this, this, although the lease before you tonight is very small, it's part of a much larger project, the, the redevelopment of that block. And there has been some question, some criticism of the uh, downtown riverfront urban renewal area in investing and, and, and spending money on, on helping our unsheltered neighbors. I think the redevelopment of that block is, a, is, is a, one of the best examples of the URA board's commitment to continued economic redevelopment by, by, by investing in that block. I just wanted to remind uh, the board of that decision you've made, uh, what was that, two, two or three years ago, uh, Kristen? About three years ago. Yeah. So again, part of that that journey that that member Lewis uh, was asking about. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Yes. Uh, so, uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, and I apologize if I'm a bit slow. Um, I, I do appreciate uh, Councillor Lewis for drawing attention to these um, action items tonight. Um, I think that it's important for the city to get a sense and get a better communication from us. Um, about what we are doing to uh, address homelessness. I served on the Homeless Solutions Task Force with Jim Lewis, and at the very least, if we can communicate clearly some of our, our, our next steps and plans, I think that will, will help ease some minds. I mean, people really, they want to see action, and this is, you know, some real action that's starting to take place. Also, I'm a huge fan of the sobering center that is literally built or being built, so I would, of course, like to see that come to full fruition in the future. I can't tell you how much I agree with you on that. That took a lot of uh, a lot of work getting it this far, and then to have it stop. But we had uh, partners who just couldn't stick with us all the way through the the effort, and we'll talk about those offline sometime. Yeah, I'm sure you can help us on one of them. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Yes, uh, real quickly, I just want to echo um, what I heard from uh, Councillor Nordyke and show my appreciation for the uh, urban renewal area and also the city in general for the work that they've put in and continue to put in. Um, thank you very much. Great, now we have a motion. Oh, did I see somebody? Okay, we have motion on the floor, 3A. Uh, Amy, would you call the roll? Board member Hoy. Aye. Board member Nordyke. Aye. Board Member Lewis? Aye. Board Member Leung? Aye. Board Member Anderson? Aye. Board Member Nanke is absent. Board Member Osk is absent and Chair Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Councillor Lewis, let's have a motion on 3.3B. Yeah, move uh, staff recommendation on agenda item 3.3B. Second. Second by Hoy. Okay, if... Uh, Amy, would you call the roll on that one? Board Member Nordyke. Aye. Board Member Lewis. Aye. Board Member Leung. Aye. Board Member Anderson. Aye. Board Member Nanke is absent. Board Member Osik is absent. Board Member Hoy. Aye. Chair Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Lewis, 3.3C. Yeah, I move a staff recommendation on agenda item 3.3C. Second. Second by Hoy. Amy, could you call anyone? Okay, Amy, could you call the roll? Board Member Lewis? Aye. Board Member Leung? Aye. Board Member Anderson? Aye. Board Member Nanke is absent. Board Member Osik is absent. Board Member Hoy? Aye. Board Member Nordyke? Aye. Chair Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. And that cleans up our action items, I believe. Okay, we'll move on to information reports. It's just anyone have any questions on this? 
Ms. Rutherford, did you have anything else you wanted to bring up? I do not. Okay. I believe then we are done with our business, so we are adjourned. Thank you.